Well, welcome to Benchmark Books. Um, we're glad to have you here for this uh, special occasion with Tom Alexander and his new book on Brigham Young. Uh, Tom, I've known for many years, and uh, he is the uh, Lemuel H. Red Jr. Professor Emeritus of Western American History at BYU, and he has written so many articles I don't even know. I think he'd be hard-pressed to tell you how many, uh, and many books, and I'm going to hold up a few of them because if you don't already know about them, you need to. Um, one of the most important uh, books that he's already published some time ago is Mormonism in Transition, uh, the subtitle of History of the Latter-day Saints, 1890 to 1930, the most important and uh, a landmark book done on that important trans transitioning period of the church, uh, both uh, in many ways, but as uh, doctrinally included, um, and kind of a, I don't know if it was a byproduct or I can't remember now which came first, but he did a, a, a groundbreaking article, The Reconstruction of Mormon Doctrine, uh, that was published in Sunstone originally, and then reprinted in Line Upon Line, and the editor of this book, Gary Bergera, is here. That was published by Signature Books. Uh, University of Illinois Press on Mormonism and Transition, and that has been reprinted with some revisions, and you might mention sometime, Tom, how much that book was revised. Uh, he also, oh, and I was going to say that that essay um, is essential to understanding uh, the doctrinal transition <coughs> of the church during that period. Uh, there's just nothing better, and I've told, often told people it's worth the price of this entire book just for that article. And Gary thinks so, too. And Gary thinks so, too. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of other great articles in there that are really important, uh, especially on the subject of the Godhead and how that, too, has transformed over time. So in my little snarky note here, I said that those should be read by anybody who has even a shred of interest in Mormon history and Mormon studies. Um, so I highly recommend those. And uh, another important <coughs> book that Tom has done is this biography of Wilford Woodruff, uh, Things in Heaven and Earth, The Life and Times of Wilford Woodruff, a Mormon Prophet. And I will tell you that we just acquired a very nice and valuable collection of Wilford Woodruff documents. I'll bet Tom would like to see it. Of course, he's seen everything probably. But um, so if you have a spare $50,000 in your pocket, you could get at least one of those items. Uh, <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No. Uh, his new book, Brigham Young and the Expansion of the Mormon Faith, published by University of Oklahoma Press, uh, we're very pleased to have him talk about that. Uh, I also have some nice Brigham Young <coughs> items too, including one in the glass case, a Brigham Young letter. It's kind of fun, but I'm anxious to hear what Tom has to say about uh, this book, and I know you are too. And I just want to say finally that um, as long as I've known Tom, uh, I've, I've never told him this to his face probably, <coughs> But I'm, I've always not only admired him, but kind of uh, had a sense of awe about the amount of knowledge that he has in Mormon and Western history, because I'm just a pretender. I mean, I, I love the subject, and I love to sell books on the subject, but I'm a dabbler, and, and he's the real thing. So I introduce to you now the real thing. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very much. Uh, ordinarily, I just introduce myself as one of the boys. <laughs> one of the reasons I think that observers often have uh, difficulty in understanding Brigham Young is that they don't know that his views on a number of subjects changed over time, and often quite radically. Uh, organ, uh, 
Ordinarily, with some exceptions, he became kinder and more tolerant of others during his lifetime. Uh, for instance, are there any of you here who don't know that he preached blood atonement during the Mormon Reformation of 1856-57? Uh, would you raise your hand if you didn't know that? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Now, how many of you know that he preached for peace and deplored bloodshed and criminal acts, uh, particularly against non-Mormons, in 1859 and 1860? How many of you didn't know that? Or that in 1859 he sent elders George A. Smith and Amos a. Lyman from Salt Lake City south uh, to preach the need for peace and kindness uh, to non-Mormons. How many of you didn't know that? Uh, a number of you. In a speech in the tabernacle on May 22, 1859, Brigham Young said that although he was accused of having great influence with his people, he would to God that he had influence sufficient to make every man that calls himself a saint do right. Praising the American government, and this is just a year after the army got to Utah, he also spent time, quote, admonishing the saints to be faithful and patient and not to take judgment in their own hands, and by the help of the Lord he would lead them uh, to the fountain of light. Traveling on Brigham Young's orders in 1859, Apostles George A. Smith and Amasa M. Lyman spoke in various cities denouncing murder, blood atonement, and the stealing of Gentile property. They may have reflected Brigham Young's changing views on blood, blood atonement, even though uh, the church leadership didn't officially repudiate the doctrine until 1889. How many of you have heard that Brigham Young tried to uh, block the uh, perpetrators or the prosecution of the perpetrators of the Mountain Meadows Massacre? Did you know that he sent George A. Smith and Amos a. Lyman south again in 1859, that they teamed up with Erastus Snow and Charles C. Rich uh, to try to uh, secure an investigation of the massacre. Then in 1859, after the army had been placed under civilian control, Brigham Young told the federal officials that he wanted to bring the accused to trial. He asked uh, U.S. Marshal Peter Dotson to deputize Territorial Marshal John Kay to assist in bringing them to court and he promised the federal officials that he would give them every assistance he could uh, to bring those who perpetrated the uh, massacre to, co uh, to court. Peter Dotson refused to do so. He said he wouldn't, he wouldn't deputize John Kay because Kay was a Mormon. Did you know that uh, Utah's territorial deputy William H. Hooper, with Brigham Young's approval, offered $1,500 to assist in the prosecution. Now, $1,500 today would be more than $40,000 to assist in prosecuting those people. Young proposed that the trials take place as early as 1859, somewhere near Mountain Meadows, and he thought perhaps in Parowan or Cedar City, he was able to get the, uh, the support of three of the federal officials, Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Jacob Forney, U.S. Attorney, Alexander Wilson, and Territorial Governor <coughs> Alfred Cumming. The opposition of federal judges, especially Chief Justice Delana Eccles and U.S. Marshal Peter Dotson torpedoed those efforts to bring the perpetrators to trial just two years after the massacre instead of 1875 and 1876 
uh, when John D. Lee was uh, tried, and he was, of course, the only one who was ever tried for the massacre. Did you know that George A. Smith and Amos Lyman, acting on Brigham Young's instructions, released the main participants in the massacre on July the 31st of 1859, and that the two apostles told them that they needed to prepare themselves for trial. George A. Smith then disorganized the stake, releasing Philip Klingen Smith, Samuel McMurdy, and John Morris as uh, the bishopric in, in Cedar, and Isaac Haight, John Higby, and Elias Morris as the stake presidency. Then, in their place, he called Henry Lunt, Richard Morris, and Thomas Jones, none of whom had participated in the massacre, as a combined bishopric stake presidency. Now, because of Brigham Young's actions, some of the major participants began to prepare for trial. Apostles George A. Smith and Amos Lyman told the massacre participants that they needed to prepare for trial, and the perpetrators then took the prospect of facing a jury very seriously. Sending a deed for his property in Cedar City as a retainer, Klingon Smith wrote to George A. Smith asking that Smith and Hosea Stout defend them in the forthcoming, quote, proceedings against me in a case of alleged murder at Mountain Meadows. Now, those are Klingon Smith's words. A few days later, Amos Lyman met with uh, John D. Lee on what Lee called in his journal a uh, special business. Again, proclaiming his innocence, Lee nevertheless wrote to ask George A. Smith and Hosea Stout uh, to defend him if he were arrested upon a charge of aiding in the massacre at Mountain Meadows. Then on September 11th of 1859, John D. Lee confided to his journal, and this is extremely important, that the, per, uh, that the perpetrators could expect, and I'm quoting from the journal, neither succor, symphony, uh, sympathy, or pity from the church leadership. Now, does that sound like uh, Brigham Young was trying to block the uh, prosecution of the massacre perpetrators? Isaac Haight, then, who was the, the principal who'd uh, ordered the massacre, sent George A. Smith a letter on October the 17th of 1859 asking Smith to serve as attorney and transferring half ownership of a woolen factory uh, to George A. Smith as a returner. So instead of trying to thwart the prosecution of the massacre participants, Brigham Young tried to get the, the federal officials to conduct, uh, conduct the trials of the perpetrators in 1859. And who was it that uh, pre prevented the prosecution of the perpetrators at that time, it, it wasn't Brigham Young, it was the federal officials, of especially the uh, federal judges and the U.S. Marshal. Why was that? Uh, Eccles said that he believed that if a U.S. attorney were competent, he could show that uh, Brigham Young was involved in the massacre. How many of you knew that Brigham Young's views on forgiving sinners changed over time? No hands. All of you knew that then. <laughs> Maybe I don't need to talk about this. As we this. get older, we all change our views on <laughs> In an elders' conference in November 1858, Young condemned those who sinned with their eyes wide open. Those are his words. He called on members to forsake what you know to be wrong. He said that if the bosom of the Almighty was not filled with compassion and mercy, this people would have been condemned before this. I'm ready to forgive a man or woman 70 times seven a day who is ignorantly 
in the integrity of their hearts. But when men chose heart, uh, whose hearts are full of understanding give way to iniquity, run greedily after wickedness, can I forgive them? He said, yes, if the Lord will forgive them, but he cannot forgive such offenders. Then on June the 3rd of 1860, by contrast, he said, I speak of those who have been in the habit of wrongdoing and therefore have lost confidence Pursue a course that will convince your brethren that you have reformed. Then in a sermon in 1871, he preached of God's compassion and said that if they, the Latter-day Saints, expect to enter the celestial kingdom to live with God and Christ, they, may, they must overcome this weakness not to forgive others and the wicked dispositions they have inherited through the fall. So between 1858 1860, 1871, his views changed. Uh, he thought that people could be forgiven. <clears throat> Moreover, Brigham Young held some of the most compassionate views on salvation and exaltation of any Mormon authority. Uh, let me quote to you from pages uh, 209 to 210 of my biography. Mormon commentators have taken various positions about whether people who have died could move from one degree of glory to another. What non-Mormons might call salvation to a higher one and eventually to receive exaltation and become gods. Young believed that humans could progress from glory to higher glory. In a sermon in 1859, he preached that uh, mankind's progression would continue after death for those who were prepared to progress. He said, if a deceased man or woman is not prepared to enjoy the glories of the celestial kingdom with God our Father, he is not prepared at once to enjoy a fullness of glory and promised the fullness of glory promised the faithful in the gospel. For he must be schooled while in the spirit in the other departments of the house of God, passing from truth to truth, from intelligence to intelligence, until he is prepared to again receive his body and to enter into the presence of the Father and Son. And, and what he's saying here is that he thought that uh, you could move from one kingdom to another and you could learn in the spirit world, not just in this life, how to uh, do that uh, to eventually achieve exaltation. Now, this seems to me to be extremely compassionate on uh, Brigham Young's part. Uh, he also uh, spoke about how Husbands ought to treat their wives. He gave a sermon in which he said, The Lord expects husbands to treat their wives with kindness and love. In December 1858, he said, When a man married a wife, he took her for better or worse, and he had no right to ill use her. I assume that most of you know that Latter-day Saints rejected the idea that the earth was created ex nihilo, that is, uh, from nothing. And Latter-day Saints believed that the act of Adam and Eve in taking the forbidden fruit was a progressive act that allowed humans to inhabit uh, the earth. Most Latter-day Saints, and I'm quoting here from page 217, for the faithful creation and free agency allowed men and women the possibility of achieving godhood like Adam and Eve. Uh, what, what most don't know is that a statement that was later attributed to Lorenzo Snow was first spoken by Brigham Young while the Twelve served in England. He said to Lorenzo Snow, as God was, so are we now, as he now is, so shall we be. Our father, young priest, was once born of parents, having a father and mother the same as we are. And generally, we attribute that uh, thought to Lorenzo Snow, but it originated with Brigham Young. Young believed in a progressive theology of a God who possesses knowledge. In, in this, he, had he disagreed with Orson Pratt, uh, with James E. Talmadge, and with Bruce R. McConkie. 
I should emphasize that I don't know whether he was right in, in any of these doctrines, uh, but I do know what uh, Young believed and what he wrote. Young's theology of a God who progresses him in knowledge has, I think, much to recommend it, particularly against atheism. He offers a plausible alternative to such atheists as Richard Dawkins, who favors a natural selection and against irreducible complexity. Uh, given the history of the earth, they, the atheists, uh, can't believe that an omniscient God could have created such a mess as natural history reveals. After all, scientists estimate that more than 5 billion species, perhaps 99% of all the species that have ever lived on the earth, have become extinct. If, as Young believed, God gained knowledge progressively, his lack of previous knowledge offers a theological explanation uh, for these extensions, including uh, the messiness of such mass ex uh, extinction as that of the dinosaurs. In May 1871, Brigham Young questioned the accuracy of this, the uh, creation story in Genesis. He said that Moses, quote, obtained the history and traditions of the fathers uh, from those picked out what he considered necessary. It does not matter, he said, whether it is correct or not, or whether he made, uh, whether he made it, that is the earth, in six days, or as, in as many millions of years. This, he said, is a matter that will remain of speculation in the minds of men unless he give revelation on the subject. He said, we differ very much with Christendom in regard to the science of religion. Our religion embraces all truth and every fact of existence, no matter whether it's in heaven, earth, or hell. Those are his words. <laughs> A fact is a fact, he said, all truth issues forth from the fountain of truth and the sciences as far as men have proved them. He said, the Lord is one of the most scientific men that ever lived. You have no, no idea of the knowledge that he has with regard to the sciences. Now, uh, you will understand, I think, why the Mormon people loved the prophet who led them into a wilderness where the Indians already lived. You will see how inspired his leadership was to convince thousands of Latter-day Saints to, be, to build 350 settlements and to convince some recent observers that he was the greatest colonizer in the history of the American West. You'll also see how he preserved the loyalty of his people in the face of the massive onslaught of the United States Army in 1857-58. It's a great story and one I expect all of you to enjoy as you read this biography. Now I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Uh, one thing Kurt asked was how my biography was uh, different from those that have already been published. And I've told you some of the things here. I think I have more about uh, Brigham Young's religious life in this uh, biography than either in uh, Leonard Arrington's biography or John Turner's, which are the uh, two principal biographies recently uh, published about Brigham Young. And I tried to deal with his whole life, even though uh, this is a, a short biography, uh, 350 pages, actually, uh, University of Oklahoma in this series wanted me to write 250 pages, but they let me go 100 pages longer uh, because the editor liked what I had written. Okay, now any questions? Yes? There's a story that I only have bits and pieces of. It. I was reading some things in a bookstore that existed years ago that had some things about Brigham Young. Apparently they built a spur. Uh, railroad spur line up towards the canyon in order to, to run uh, block, blocks for the temp, building the temple, okay? Now the, the workers expected they're going to be paid wages and I think some of the railroad companies had promised Brigham Young some money 
for this railroad spur, and yet the money didn't appear, and so he told the workers that, well, this was this was a church service, okay? So there were some disgruntled people, but I never quite figured out the whole story. Okay, I went into uh, Brigham Young's papers uh, to, to look up... Uh, uh, not that qu uh, question, uh, question uh, particularly, but the, the work that workers did not only on that railroad but on uh, the uh, grading uh, for the Union uh, Pacific Railroad. Uh, Brigham Young took the contract to grade on that railroad uh, from Echo Canyon out to, uh, well, uh, eventually uh, he hoped <laughs> to, uh, to uh, Wells, Nevada, but that didn't materialize. He uh, got it as far as uh, a promontory summit where the two railroads eventually joined. Uh, and it's true, he wasn't paid by the, uh, the Union uh, Pacific. And eventually what they did, uh, instead of giving him uh, several million dollars as he was supposed to receive, he got $560,000 uh, worth of uh, a track and other things which he used to build the Utah Central and to build that railroad that you uh, mentioned to try to bring the, uh, uh, the blocks down. Uh, by 1871, uh, he still owed the subcontractors on those railroads uh, about $900,000. Now, how was he going to pay that? Well, what he did uh, was to mortgage bonds of the uh, Utah Central Railroad uh, to mortgage stock that he owned in ZCMI so that he could uh, pay them. And he paid those off. By 1872, uh, he only owed $10,000, and he was able to, uh, to pay that off as well. I've written an article on that uh, for the Pioneer magazine that's published by uh, the uh, Sons of Utah Pioneers, and uh, that should appear in the issue after next. Pioneer is called? The Pioneer magazine. Gary? I, I noticed that you don't have any footnotes. Yes. Footnotes. Was that you or your publisher? No, it was the publisher. Uh, Richard Etelaine is the editor of the series. Uh, this is number 31 in the series and uh, the publisher said the book was to be written without footnotes but with uh, an extensive bibliography and so I've supplied a bibliography of the sources that I used. I would have prepared, uh, prepared excuse me, <coughs> preferred to have written it with footnotes uh, the way I, uh, I have the other books that I've written, that I have written, but he wanted it that way. He said that's what the series did. So was it a different process for you writing this book? Yeah, it was. <laughs> it, it meant uh, that I had to uh, go to the sources, write paragraphs, then I did a lot of revising of the, uh, the manuscript uh, because I didn't have all the sources in, uh, in hand while I was writing it. Yes. I'm not familiar with the Mount Meadow Massacre in, in detail, in fact, very, uh, not even in a general way. Who was the final authority that ordered it? Was it federal or state? It was, uh, it was a, a group of uh, members of the church from Cedar City that organized the uh, massacre under the orders of Isaac Haight, who was the, uh, the state president. Uh, he sent Lee out first. Uh, with uh, a, a few Indians, and uh, when they weren't able to uh, finish the uh, massacre, he sent others out, uh, and uh, the massacre took place in September of 1857. I meant the authority for the trial itself. Oh, he meant the trial. It, oh, the trial. Was it yes, it was uh, done by the federal government. Utah was a, a territory at the time, uh, so it was under the uh, plenary uh, jurisdiction of the uh, federal government. Uh, the judge uh, was a, a federal judge, uh, and uh, the trial... He wanted to bring Brigham in, right? Yeah, he did. Uh, 
During the first uh, uh, trial, the uh, uh, prosecutor, oh boy, I'm uh, forgetting stuff here. I'll, I'll remember it in a, a minute. Wait for 10 more years. <laughs> it gets worse. Yeah, I'm only 83, so. Um, what was the question? Let's see. He wrote Under the Prophet in, no, no he, he wrote Reminiscences of Early Utah. Can any of you Baskin, remember? Baskin, Baskin, Baskin. Baskin. R.N. Baskin was assistant U.S. attorney who uh, conducted the prosecution in the first uh, trial. Uh, Baskin, instead of trying to try John D. Lee, uh, tried to bring in everything he could uh, to try to show that Brigham Young had been uh, responsible for it. He wasn't successful in that. How did that finally shift? Uh, it, it finally uh, shifted in the uh, second trial uh, when the U.S. attorney uh, uh, agreed to try John D. Lee instead of uh, Brigham Young. And Lee was the one that was uh, at trial. And uh, Lee was convicted, a uh, unanimous verdict. Uh, in the second trial, all of those who uh, were in the jury were Latter-day Saints. Yeah. I find it a little bit ironic that <clears throat> Amos Lyman, who arguably was the second most uh, salient figure next to Brigham Young in uh, church history in the settlement of Utah was excommunicated for his variation on the atonement of Christ when his seems mild compared to Brigham Young's blood atonement doctrine of the atonement of Christ. <clears throat> Why would Brigham Young not overlook that to keep a beloved apostle, one of the few he got along with very well, <laughs> and kick him out for a, a doctrine that was mild compared to his blood atonement. Yeah, I, I have to say I don't know, Jake. You do know. That's why I came here tonight. <laughs> okay. You know what you're not saying or you don't know? No, I, do, I really don't know. I know why Brigham Young wasn't uh, uh, excommunicated for preaching blood atonement, <laughs> even, even though it uh, denies what the Book of Mormon says about, uh, I mean, you, uh, it's very difficult to hold a trial for the president of the church. <laughs> I'm thinking, <clears throat> it's occurred to me, I know some of Amos's descendants, and I know Leo, it occurs to me he might have been undergoing some neurological degeneration in yeah. those years that, that uh, Made him a little I don't know. Uh, I, what I do know, and I have read uh, Leo's biography of Amos Lyman, uh, is that uh, the, the Quorum of the Twelve in excommunicating uh, Amos Lyman uh, was wrong about Lyman's views. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions I can't answer? Yeah. <laughs> Daniel? <laughs> about Brigham Young changing his views on a number of doctrines or teachings that he had. And so I'm wondering what he thought of the revelatory process. How did he conceive of receiving revelation from God and then turning that into doctrine that he would teach? Uh, he, he had a discussion of that question uh, with uh, the members of the Quorum of the, uh, the Twelve. Uh, they brought up the uh, issue of whether uh, people who disagreed with one another, who were members of the uh, Quorum of the Twelve and First Presidency, all of whom would be sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators, uh, th they agreed with one another that they wouldn't contradict one another's views. But then Young said that he believed that the things that he said were inspired. And uh, I I'm not sure just exactly how that squares with the decision that, that he made in council with the Quorum of the Twelve. But uh, he was of the, the opinion that the things he said were inspired. At uh, one time when he talked about sermons that he gave, uh, none of his sermons and the sermons of others who were given uh, in the uh, 19th century were prepared. It's not like conference today where they spend months preparing a, a, a sermon. Uh, all of them were extemporaneous, or better said, impromptu. That is, 
what Brigham Young said was that I open my mouth and the Lord fills it. Those are his words. And sometimes that was true. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same question. Let me restate it because that was a big thing for me. It seems to me that his compassion changed based on his experience more so than by revelation. Well, I, I think he would have denied that. but uh, well, the... I know. <laughs> it, it's hard to say which one of his positions were inspired. Because he would say all of them were inspired. Yeah, you know, and it's hard, it's hard to uh, uh, to tell that. Uh, I have a lot of difficulty with this uh, blood atonement preaching because it contradicts what the the uh, Book of Mormon says about an uh, infinite in atonement. And then those are the Book of Mormon words. And I think that the uh, first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve uh, eventually understood that Brigham Young had been wrong uh, about that and they repudiated the doctrine officially in a, in a document that was uh, signed by all of the members of the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve in 1889. Say it had been after his death. Uh, that was it was after Brigham Young's death. Wil Wilford Woodruff uh, was president of the church at that time. Mm -hmm. What's the most common or easiest uh, source of that repudiation? Uh, 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 the uh, 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 statements of the First Presidency by James R. Clark. Uh, that's uh, reported verbatim in uh, one of the volumes of uh, the, uh, the statements of uh, James R. Clark's statements of the First uh, of the uh, First Presidency. Or you can look at my biography of Wilfred Woodruff. There's a, a reference to it uh, there. Uh, because it took place while Wilfred Woodruff was president of the church. Yeah, Kurt? I was uh, busy sampling all the refreshments, so I may have missed something. Uh, d did you enjoy them? <laughs> no, no, I may have missed it, but did you, do you talk uh, much? You brought up blood atonement a few times here, but you talk much about his Adam God ideas? Yes, I do. I uh, I have a discussion of that uh, in uh, in the biography, um, and uh, the the source of uh, of that uh, of the uh, uh, discussion. And where where do you come out on that? As far as I I don't think that it's right. Uh, I think that uh, the the church has never accepted the uh, point of view uh, that. Uh, uh, Adam was God, and uh, that Adam was the father of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was uh, what Brigham Young preached, and I don't think he's right about that. And the church obviously repudiated that as well. Yeah, that's right, but it's never been officially repudiated. It's yeah. simply, the church simply says that its doctrine is that uh, Adam wasn't God. There have been some individuals who certainly have. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I note that... Uh, you are rehabilitating uh, Brigham Young uh, and his religious life and his feelings, particularly as he evolved into this compassionate type of person and also peaceful. Uh, and you listed several of the things that he did wrong, uh, uh, at least in the preface, but I don't see any uh, preface material on uh, blacks and the priesthood. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, I deal with what Brigham Young did in that. Uh, in 1847, Brigham Young uh, preached almost verbatim, the passage from the book of Acts that said we're all made of one flat, uh, flesh. By 1852, in 1852, he gave a sermon in which, uh, and this was to the territorial legislature when the legislature uh, was considering uh, the uh, slavery law that Utah eventually passed. And uh, he said that uh, blacks could not hold the priesthood in uh, that uh, sermon. Uh, he also said that he was very much opposed to uh, slavery uh, in the, uh, the same sermon. But from that, uh, the church adopted the uh, point of view until late, uh, 1978 uh, that uh, uh, blacks could not hold the priesthood and uh, women who were black could not uh, be uh, sealed in the temple or received their endowments. Uh, and uh, I think 
that what happened was that Brigham Young, and I say this in the biography, Brigham Young was influenced by contemporary Protestant thought on that, uh, that question. Uh, as you uh, may know, uh, Protestant churches were split between North and, uh, and South uh, during this period. And I think that uh, Brigham Young was influenced by that thought. And I, I say that in the biography. Now, uh, I may be wrong about that, uh, but uh, that seems to me from the way he said it, uh, that it was the same as uh, Protestant thought. Yes? I think I can see why Mormon, Mormonism in transition needed to be written and explained because I think a lot of this was to clarify what Brigham Young was not so <laughs> clear about <laughs> with all his inspirations. Well, there were a lot of changes that, uh, that took place in the period between 1890 and 1930. Uh, some of them were uh, doctrinal clarifications. Uh, others, eventually, uh, it took some time for the church to uh, give up the practice of uh, plural marriage. If, if you were living in 1890 when the, the manifesto was issued and uh, you believed that plural marriage was necessary for your exaltation, uh, what would you do? Well, well, most of the members of the church followed, uh, Brigham, uh, followed uh, Wilford Woodruff's uh, counsel, but there were a number of uh, plural marriages that took place after 1890. And uh, in 1904, President Joseph F. Smith issued uh, what we call the Second Manifesto, in which he said that people would be tried for their church membership uh, if they entered into new plural marriage. And there were a number who did, and it was after that that the fundamentalist movement uh, got really going well. Gary? Is, so is, is blood atonement the most frustrating thing about Brigham Young for you? For, for me? Uh, Probably that and Adam God, but but blood atonement uh, particularly, uh, because I, I have a, an extremely difficult time understanding how if you believe that Christ's atonement was infinite, you could also believe that there were some sins that you had to spill your own blood for. That that it makes no sense to me, and I think uh, eventually when the uh, church leadership in 1889 uh, issued uh, the uh, repudiation of the doctrine that uh, they recognize it too, that he had simply been wrong about that. Yes? You talked about um, how he changed his views over, over time, and, and um, I just wonder, is there, have you seen any um, evidence where those two particular doctrines were, by the end of his life, he'd maybe changed his mind about I think that he never changed his mind about Adam God, but uh, given the uh, lack of sermons after uh, 1859 on blood atonement, I think that he may have changed his uh, views on that. He didn't ever explicitly say that he did, but his uh, sermons about compassion, about being kind to one another, about not taking other lives uh, and things of that sort seem to indicate uh, to me uh, that his views about blood atonement uh, may have uh, changed. And uh, we have a, a complete set, five volumes, of uh, Brigham Young's sermons that Richard Van Wagner uh, published and uh, Signature Books uh, published those. Uh, I ha have a set of those. I looked through the index. I spent some time going through uh, the uh, various sermons that Brigham Young uh, had uh, or said. And uh, by late in his life, uh, Van Wagner thought that there was a sermon on blood atonement, but, but it wasn't about the blood atonement that uh, Brigham Young had talked about in 1857 and 58. It was about people giving their lives uh, as a testimony uh, for their faithfulness. And uh, it's quite different uh, from the, that earlier uh, preaching. Yes. 
Do you have a sense of why Brigham Young so uh, fiercely condemned the biographical sketches of the Prophet Joseph Smith? By, uh, by, his, by uh, Joseph Smith's mother, by Lucy Smith. I don't know why he did that. I, I can't understand it. He said there were a lot of mistakes in it. That was uh, Brigham Young's uh, reason for, uh, for feeling uh, that way. Uh, I think you have to accept that uh, book as Lucy's memoir of the events that uh, took place during her lifetime. Uh, and I don't know why he condemned them. Yes? I was going to ask one <clears throat> about uh, polygamy being required as a, as a requirement for the celestial kingdom. I believe he uh, taught that or implied that. He, he did, and uh, George A. Uh, uh, a number of others did. George Q. Cannon did. Uh, Joseph F. Smith did. Joseph F. Smith's views on that uh, changed uh, later on. Uh, he uh, uh, preached something different beginning in uh, 1887 uh, when the uh, church was trying to uh, stop the passage of the Edmunds Tucker Act. Uh, he, he said something quite different uh, then. Uh, but Brigham, as far as I know, uh, continued to believe that through his lifetime. I don't know any time uh, when he said anything different. Now, I, I could be wrong about that, but uh, I believe that he thought that was the case. Yes? There's a, I'm aware that there are a number of shorthand accounts of Brigham Young's sermons that may ne never have been transcribed, so we may not even have copies of some of those sermons. Is it, are you aware of anybody trying to retrieve those? Yes, Lugene Curset, uh, yeah, Bal uh, excuse me, Carruth. <laughs> Eugene Purcell Carruth has been uh, transcribing the uh, sermons that had not been transcribed uh, before. And I believe that it's the intention of the uh, Church History Department to uh, publish those online. But uh, I owe a great deal to Lugene. Uh, when I was working on the uh, biography of uh, Wilford Woodruff, uh, I hired her uh, to translate the Deseret Alphabet stuff. And she says that I was the first one to ever hire her to do any work like that. And uh, she has learned uh, Pittman and Taylor shorthand and is able to, uh, to translate things uh, that have never been uh, translated before. And, uh, she, she's a, a real phenomenon. Yes. There, there are a number of those uh, sermons already on the, in the church uh, website. The, the, yeah, the, the cat, church history catalog. Um, and I, I just wondered how, um, I, there was an article in BYU Studies um, that she was involved in where it said some of those sermons were quite different in the Journal of Discourses versus <laughs> what the shorthand had. Um, I just wondered how useful some of those transcriptions had been to you in, in some of the research for them. I didn't have them available to me at the time I was uh, writing this. Uh, I, I learned afterward uh, that Lugene was uh, uh, transcribing them. Uh, I used uh, a lot of Brigham Young's papers that were online at the time, uh, but as far as I knew at the time I was writing the biography, those sermons were not there. Well, thank you very much. I hope that I've clarified the book and that you enjoy reading it.